have Dr. Mishra today, who is CEO of uh, Agility Pharma. Dr. Mishra is the founding president and CEO of AAPM, the American Association for Precision Medicine and chair of ACT, uh, AAPM Corona uh, Virus Task Force, which is leading research efforts at preventing and curing COVID-19, uh, cancer and other chronic diseases. Uh, he does not only treat the sick, but also provides knowledge and tools to individuals to live longer, healthier lives. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur uh, who founded his first company after graduating high school. You know, who, who could say that, actually? <laughs> and second company while earning his Ph.D. Uh, not, not that his Ph.D. was too demanding. Since then, uh, he has accumulated a wealth of experience in building, investing, and uh, advising numerous company, companies at different stages. He is an investor, co-founder, board member of several corporations, and his real focus is on drug discovery, development, data analytics, robotics, mental health, and my favorite, digital health. Uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, we look forward to hearing about precision medicine. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Just a check, actually, you know, can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, as uh, you know, uh, as it was mentioned, actually, the t title of the talk is "Precision Medicine: The Way Forward," uh, and uh, basically, I would uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, so uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, start by uh, a quote by Barack Obama, uh, who said, and that's why we are here today, because something called precision medicine gives us one of the greatest opportunities for new medical breakthroughs that we have ever seen. And this, these are basically learning objectives, and I'll walk you through uh, these. Uh, first, uh, I would like to, you know, introduce uh, the field of precision medicine, how it evolved. You know, needs exa few examples, and uh, you know, w and kind of dive, take you, uh, you know, for a deep dive in a his history how the field began. So, uh, the uh, so as as per uh, I think actually as I have followed, and some of you who have followed the field, we all know that. Uh, the field evolved uh, uh, from a, a, a smaller uh, field called pharmacogenetics that studied inherited differences, that is variations in drug metabolism and response uh, being used to determine drug behavior in order to improve the efficacy of drugs and uh, and um, uh, personalized or individualized medicine, you know, the words were co coined later on. And according to me, these are the clinical applications of pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics, actually. So that's the simple way to put it. But but although the personalized and individualized, uh, you know, uh, 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 terms were out there, I think when I will go and give a talk, uh, you know, somebody would uh, always get up and ask, uh, hey, how we are going to get, uh, you know, so much money so that we can... Uh, treat each patient you know uh, uh, differently actually so that the, so the the nomenclature was not that uh, you know uh, great and we all realize it so eventually the field evolved to be called precision medicine and basically as the field also became broader to encompass uh, not only not only the treatment option but also observe, uh, you know, the lifestyle as well as uh, 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 lifestyle of individuals uh, to see how we can uh, also, you know, integrate uh, digital health as well as disease prevention. So precision medicine is an emerging approach for disease prevention and treatment that takes into account uh, uh, people's individual variations in genes, environment and lifestyle. And um, the goal is uh, being, you know, uh, so uh, uh, traditionally most uh, medical care is based on expected response to an average patient. And we all know that there is no such thing as average, average patient. So the goal is to... Uh, move uh, you know towards um, medical care that is based on individuals genomic environmental and, and lifestyle differences enabling more precise methods to prevent and treat diseases and some of it is already there you know uh, sequencing uh, immunotherapy you know individualized immunotherapy targeted therapy so these are um, you know already being uh, practiced in the clinic today so we have made a great uh, progress uh, and uh, in figuring out uh, you know uh, a precision medicine approach 
much uh, so that we can focus preventive and uh, therapeutic interventions on those who benefit and sparing the side effects to those who would not. So again, to reiterate, you know, to kind of uh, solidify in your memory, precision medicine takes into account individuals' genetic, environmental, uh, lifestyle, as well as lifestyle factors, actually. Uh, so uh, historically, you know, in uh, in early, uh, you know, 2010, 11, 12, uh, National Research Council at the National Academies was given a task to kind of uh, um, uh, 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 see where the field will be moving forward. So I think they all were very much excited about uh, what Google Maps was able to do to you know were able to lay down um, you know several layers of data set together and they all thought hey it will be amazing if we can lay down all the you know uh, omics data genome epigenome microbiome you know uh, exposome all that together and can we uh, so-called create a knowledge network where you know where uh, data from biomedical research as well as clinical medicine will fuel into it and and, um, and then the knowledge uh, the knowledge network itself will become uh, uh, basically a uh a tool to validate any new data that comes in, and more data we feed in, the uh, you know the knowledge network becomes more uh, you know perfect actually. So that was a uh, you know great vision, and uh, some of us you know took that vision and run with it, and so far. This is a, a slide from UCSF. You can see that the you know vision is a little bit evolved, but I think major you know so uh, so you can say the three pillars of biomedical research you know basic basic sciences, population sciences, clinical discovery, data from these you know is uh, feeds to uh, you know uh, digital in you know in uh, tools such as digital health, computational health, imaging omics, et, you know, ethics and engagement, all that data, you know, goes into information commons that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, is used to build a knowledge network that is basically integrated uh, uh, data sets. And this knowledge network then, you, you know, it can be further utilized to, uh, you know, enable innovation. So it's basically fuels back to the, uh, to, uh, the, you know, the pile right here. And this knowledge, and uh, it can also be utilized to, for the knowledge-enabled discovery. Actually, so I think, and 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 the cycle continues. So, uh, what have been uh, challenges? Actually, you know, there are always challenges. So I gave you the silver lining, but uh, uh, the so there are challenges, and we all, as a community, has to you know uh, address these challenges. This is one of the you know a survey that was done in 2017 that uh, identified unstable or non-secure legal and regulatory framework as one of the majority of hurdles in in uh, you know moving precision medicine forward uh, you know followed by lack of access to relevant data data silos and a limited ability to integrate data sources were runner runner ups actually and you know for those who are studying cancer you know uh, tumor heterogeneity is a problem inter and intratumoral heterogeneity you know is a problem actually and, um, and 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 that's not also uh, you know a challenging the, there is a further challenge so the tumor evolution is a challenge so you know you can see that uh, uh, primary tumor when it uh, you know is treated and the disease relapses the relapsed tumor has a you know entirely different uh, uh, genomic sequence so basically that leaves us to anticipation based chemotherapy actually so and also number of mutations in human cancers is uh, there are a lot actually you know so but, uh, it's uh, it's sometimes challenging to know which ones are actionable mutations and which ones are not actually, and also uh, shear mutation rates across cancers are not uniform. So you can see that rhabdomyosarcoma being the least mutagenic, and you know melanoma, UV mediated melanoma being the most uh, mutagenic actually. So that's also. That's so. You know the 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 what we are pointing out is that you know are, are there opportunity to treat uh, you know the more mutagenic cancers with uh, with precision medicine. Uh, you know, so that's all. Uh, that's a question actually. And uh, and overall, uh, you know, uh, I think we have made a lot of progress. Just to give you an example, it, we have changed the view of the lung view of lung cancer. You know, it was uh, the traditional view of squamous uh, you know uh, cell cancer carcinoma 
carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma that has now, you know, changed to, you know, KRAS, EGFR, HER2, BRAF, AKT1, uh, PA3 kinase, you know, and the list is, you know, further evolving, actually. So, the, so various subsets of cancers, actually. And not only just disease classification, but you can see that the, uh, 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 so now there are uh, 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 patients when they uh, get the individualized therapy, the patient is same, goes through a genetic test, test, one report is created. And based on that report, you know, based on the mutation profile, the physician makes a decision to give him one or her one therapy, uh, second therapy or a combination, actually. So these are these are practices in the clinic. Uh, and another challenge is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, so far, uh, you know, muta- so far the sequencing efforts are, you know, majority of the times take, uh, you know, encoding uh, 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 gene um, and into account, but non-coding gene is um, is an amazing, actually amazingly abundant in our human DNA. Uh, so human genome consists of 6% evolutionary conserved sequences, but the protein coding is uh, approximately 1.2%. And most uh, evolutionary, uh, you know, innovations concerns the uh, and non-coding um, uh, sequence and most functional information is non-coding and you know and as you see this uh, these are the so you know mRNA has become a household name after the you know COVID mRNA vaccination uh, but you know I have spent my career studying this and if you follow the UTR so uh, you know untranslated region f- uh, five prime untranslated region as as we evolve the 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 five prime um, uh, you know length was uh, conserve whereas three prime utr length keeps on increasing suggesting that we are humans not because we have uh, you know more proteins or we have uh, you know um, uh, but because those proteins are very well regulated so these uh, allow you know sites for regulatory uh, agents to bind and then you know i was fortunate to contribute to development of this field um, which is now called non coding rna variations and population in, in in variations in associated with uh, you know in populations in, of uh, in, in disease progression or drug response actually so these variations in in the utr region they basically you know interfere with the normal regulation uh, you know leading to up regulation or down regulation of a gene if a gene is an oncogene it leads to you know cancer formation uh, if it's a, a drug re- gene associated with drug resistance genes up regulations you know causes drug resistance and and it and in in the similar concept has been you know proven in several other diseases so this is also an amazing opportunity that has been presented and can be addressed by, you know, uh, by uh, whole genome sequencing, actually. So, and oncogene bypass, actually, this is a, one of the problems. So, in therapy, if you are uh, inhibiting one oncogene, actually, the the uh, disease, uh, the you know, uh, so basically you turned off uh, what the cancer tries to do is it survives by activating another oncogene pathway. So, and then sometimes there's no drug actually. So we are back to square one. And also, you know, uh, there are several genetic tests, but they always point to risks, but not always a cure. So we have to more, uh, you know, focus on m- more on cures, actually. And, you know, one of the uh, earlier uh, studies, uh, you know, uh, identified uh, poor accuracy and reproducibility of lab developed, reproducibility of lab developed tests, LTDs, actually. And then FDA actually intervened. And now, you know, FDA is also, you you know, has you know, is regulating the you know some of the uh, lab developed tests that are widely y- utilized actually, and they have also launched Precision FDA to address the advances in precision medicine. Um, so the way forward, you know, I think uh, so. That's the. So as, as I mentioned before, you know the you know human genome sequencing has become more common. The, you can see that the cost of human genome you know sequencing has uh, defied Moore's law actually, and uh, uh, you know there are uh, currently you know uh, various uh, uh, government-funded national genomic medicine initiatives. They're all over the world. So basically now we are you know collecting uh, you know uh, uh, genomic you know sequ- you know sequencing information 
from from uh, all around the populations and all around the world. And this uh, this is you know, uh, uh, and just to let you know that some of these uh, are you know already uh, being util approaches are utilized. This is the MD Anderson. You know, they they uh, you know classify patients when a patient comes to by molecular profile profiling, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, utilizing prognostic markers, uh, markers to predict drug sensitivity, resistance, and markers to predict adverse drug events. And based on this, they are, you know, they basically you know, assign uh, folks in a different groups and they treat uh, those groups, uh, you know, uh, precisely or, uh, uh, or in, a, uh, in a more uh, uh, personalized, individualized settings, actually. So uh, data integration has been one of the challenges in precision medicine, and we have, as a community, addressed that. Uh, you know, uh, so we we need to basically, you know, uh, see if, uh, with the patient and with respect to patients, we have to bring together clinical data, med and labs data, claims and transactions data, uh, patient experience and genomics data. You know, these are all uh, siloed. How do we we basically integrate all that uh, together so that we have a uh, a well integrated uh, you know uh, ecosystem so that brings us to the big data and big data ecosystem is very huge actually you can see that the you know uh, in a, in a, uh, app, in in applications industry that's where life sciences we are in healthcare we are we have we uh, you know have this is the space there are a lot of open source uh, companies and data source apis so those who are working on solutions you can utilize those uh, uh, platforms so it, i usually big data, you know, I have an, uh, another 45 minutes talk, so I think I would, uh, uh, this is a very complex field, so I will just spare you with the with this and just, you know, continue with the pace of the precision medicine. So uh, data silos, as I mentioned, is one of the problems. Uh, so it, uh, data silo is, exists in, you know, uh, in institutional warehouses as well as intra and intra-institutional warehouses, actually. And uh, it, this can be solved. Uh, you know, examples include, uh, you know, uh, a network of sharing, so you know the GA four GH Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, basically, and also American Association for Precision Medicine, an innovation collective, also you know uh, is a, a place where uh, stakeholders have come together, and IP guardianship has been provided by the American Association of Precision Medicine, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal team actually. So, uh, so, uh, so. Uh, so the next challenge is that affordability you know so it uh, uh, some we have the sciences we, we have made a great advancement in the science but i think pairs uh, have to catch up with which tests are you know uh, you know which tests are uh, you know, can be approved uh, the payments can be approved or not and this is where it for patients it makes a much difference because these tests are costly actually so and you know, coming back to exposome you know uh, precision public health is becoming a new field which is, uh, you know, social and ecological factors, you know, must be accounted on top of individual-based uh, fine-grained approach for precision medicine. So your, uh, you know, the area where you live, you know, uh, is a disaster area. You know, f uh, you know, uh, you know, you, are you living in a, f uh, you know, food deserts or racial? What is the racial disp disparity? You know, uh, what are the you know, chances of vector-borne diseases actually, and what is the overall welfare? So I think that's the that also determines the, uh, you know, exposome-mediated, uh, you know, uh, diseases. So it'll be good to know. And uh, what are the expected benefits, you know, uh, of precision medicine in a different stage of clinical care pathway? They can be utilized for prevention, as I mentioned, to identify at-risk groups and uh, uh, target prevention. They can identify, you know, uh, we can use for diagnostics. We can detect diseases at earlier stages when it is easier to treat. And uh, at treatment stage, we can optimize therapies and and reduce adverse re reactions, like I mentioned in the previous examples. Uh, um, uh, and so, and overall, we are contributing towards improving health-related outcomes. Actually, and you know, the pharma industry has a you know learned this lesson that there is high failure rates during the late stage of drug development. Actually, um, and, and there is one of the reports suggested approximately seventy-six percent failure rates. Actually, so so it, it is in pharma's uh, you know uh, pharma's favor 
to uh, uh, to uh, you know have a precision made, uh, uh, medicine based approach early on to have a drug diagnostics combination so that they can they can you know kind of further tailor their population to the responders and not include non responders in their treatment and i think this is a, a and this is a, a, a list of fda approved combinations uh, 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 in diagnostics assessed by the year uh, you know in in 2020 uh, actually so you can see that there were there are approximately 44 um, uh, 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 you know uh, drugs that were approved had a, some kind of a diagnostics uh, uh, component in it and overall if you look at the FDA database there are 457 unique drugs available with some kind of a pharmacogenetics test available in, in labels available so I think uh, so for those who want to you know explore there are options actually so and future perspective so where what's happening actually and where are we going so um, we have medicine past in medicine and in past it was based on personal uh, it was based on a symptom uh, symptoms actually and the present medicine is based on pattern and the future medicine in future medicine will be algorithm based actually so in short like I uh, described so that there will be personal integrated uh, omics data that will be combined with the imaging data to build a personal molecular classifier and uh, and and a lot of institutions have already done this and then as a new um, as a new uh, you know patient comes in the the data goes through the personal molecular classifier identifying the right drug and right drug com in diagnostic combinations uh, uh, which the report is delivered to a physician via digital health and physician um, uh, utilize uh, utilizes uh, you know if Physician conveys the promise of physician medicine to a patient, which is a right drug to the right patient to the right time, actually. So it, to maximize the potential of precision medicine, we must uh, provide r robust, sustainable, and predictable funding increases to NCI, NIH, and FDA, and you know support regulatory uh, science initiatives like a precision FDA. And FDA has taken a you know an uh, amazing stand at this, and you know, during the pandemic, and they have really really you know, uh, uh, kind of change the norm of uh, uh, how the, the timelines uh, associated with approval of drugs, actually, and increase patient participation in precision medicine initiatives, actually, you know, uh, uh, you know access to clinical trial and, um, and knowledge given to physicians that this clinical trial is enrolling so that they can pass on the patient, develop and train biomedical research workforce of tomorrow and support precision medicine efforts, actually. And, uh, you know, overall, uh, uh, precision medicine uh, you know there are, there are uh, you know some government uh, uh, so all uh, for those who know the all of us program is uh, is uh, uh, is creating a cohort of over one million you know American volunteers who will share their genetic data biologic samples and diet lifestyle information all linked to their you know electronic uh, health records if they choose and uh, and uh, you know rarely is rarely uh, Google's uh, you know uh, spin-off is also doing the you know similar study called you know, uh, 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 it's a, uh, 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 it's a, uh, yeah, I, I just blanked out on that. But then I think that the, uh, their their study is also, you know, uh, similar uh, focus. And overall, uh, this will, uh, this is a great, uh, uh, you know, initiative that will, uh, you know, tell us uh, how, uh, uh, so yeah, where is this project baseline, actually, that's their, um, yeah, that's the, their project is called. So overall, uh, what we will learn is that how uh, the lifestyle differences, you know, uh, make uh, patients sick or, or uh, healthy actually and genetic and non-discrimination act it protects americans against discrimination based on genetic information when it comes to health insurance and employment actually so and and it fully enables uh, folks to take uh, you know utilize promise of personalized uh, precision medicine without fear of discrimination and in the remaining um, uh, five minutes i can focus on american association for precision medicine and uh, the goal it has you know uh, the uh, uh, role it has been paying playing to uh, accelerate the field of precision medicine through research, education, communication, and collaboration to foster new medical breakthroughs. So our goal is to facilitate dialogue between four pieces of precision medicine, that is patient, providers, public health planners, that's government, and payers to work together to achieve the goal of delivering improved outcomes. 
So we have a, a data AI community, you know, uh, data, we call it Data AI National Summit. In short, it's DANCE, actually. It's an amazing, vibrant community, and I invite you to join. Uh, the community meets once a year in our EAPM, you know, annual meeting. Uh, 2021 was a blast, and, and 2022 is in planning. And we also have um, uh, a cancer uh, precision oncology-based community. It's called Excellence in Precision Oncology in Shard Expo. Uh, and we, uh, uh, so inaugural expo was done, um, was organized on, on the Ohana floors of Salesforce Tower, actually. Uh, so it's a very, very, uh, you know, uh, amazing meeting and amazing experience to join uh, this. And APM uh, has an action-oriented team and we are, you know, innovation is in, is on our, you know, it's on, uh, is a, you know, our priority actually. So we have, uh, you know, we have uh, created, we have an innovation center actually. We have spun out several companies. We also have an investor club um, where, you know, uh, these are partnering investors who also match our investments actually in those uh, 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 companies actually and uh, uh, we are also uh, uh, in, in a process of creating a foundation fund where we are going to you know uh, uh, you know issue grants to uh, uh, organizations individuals as well as uh, um, as well as uh, you know other nonprofits who are uh, you know running uh, precision medicine based initiatives actually so I already spoke about APM angels and investors uh, meeting if you are interested you can just write to the email address and uh, will you have to be accredited investor to be part of it actually and you know and and last uh, we'll, we'll tell you the story of APM coronavirus task force which is the first uh, you know global coronavirus task force that was created it is a global network of experts in clinical science technical and advocacy backgrounds focused on discovering and disseminating strategies for covid-19 and we had uh, you know uh, uh, approximately nine uh, um, project teams uh, uh, one ai ml data science focused uh, partnerships prevention policy, diagnostics, therapeutic supply chain, impact investments, and, uh, content and media, and mental health uh, to, you know, basically uh, tackle challenges associated with uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, actually. And APM Act actually utilized the um, ecosystem that APM built that uh, includes technology partners, investors, member companies, hospitals, healthcare institutions, uh, startups, as well as academic and government institutions, actually. So we provide together training programs, mentorship, advisors, uh, as well as, you know, advisory uh, hours. So APM is a unique ecosystem, is a unique ecosystem of experts and corporations providing, you know, domain expertise, mentoring, ecosystem connects, funding, and data-driven, you know, innovation. And we have an amazing uh, group of uh, uh, you know uh, group of uh, uh, you know uh, members and you know supporters and the list is uh, uh, continuously growing and some i can just uh, you know uh, summarize what we have done without going into a uh, detail we focused our our efforts on how do we prevent the spread we even created an algorithm that predicted in U.S., which states will have, uh, you know, will have the um, uh, outbreak before anybody knew, actually. So we created at one of our, um, uh, you know, innovation initiatives, actually. And can we change quickly? Can we quickly diagnose? And we we took a, you know, a really early stand on creating ACE2 antibody. That's what that was came out of our, our, you know, initiative, actually. And can we treat rapid effect? Can you provide rapid and effective treatment? And we have um, uh, spun out a company that's bringing out bringing uh, you know uh, covid uh, drugs to uh, patients actually and can we you know provide uh, uh, you know remote uh, assistance to patients uh, uh, and physicians actually in so uh, uh, remote surgery uh, and related uh, innovations and uh, how can we uh, you know uh, can we solve the post-pandemic mental uh, footprint? That is, uh, so the, you know, this is a COVID-19 crisis. It's also a mental health crisis. So I think we have a, a mental health task force that uh, you know deals with it. And and that's the drug that I talked about. We have already submitted uh, you know, pre and application to US FDA and receive a very you know a positive response. So so this is a drug that basically has a four mechanism of action, and uh, it's a uh, it's a you know right drug to uh, uh, to uh, uh, address the challenges that are associated with the COVID-19 actually. 
And, uh, you know, we have also uh, uh, have a philanthropic initiative when we all uh, s uh, have seen what was happening in India and we, um, uh, our coalition, uh, we, we were, our task force was active in India and our coalition came together and sent uh, uh, up to uh, $4.5 million worth of stuff to India to help uh, in the overall medical system. We partnered with the uh, lead, uh, you know, leading uh, 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 so in, uh, Anupam Care and his uh, Care Foundation, who is, you know Anupam is a, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, promising uh, 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 you know actors in Indian film industry, as well as uh, uh, hospitals and healthcare uh, institutions to provide uh, the help that they needed. APM also was one of one of the first uh, the first uh, you know uh, uh, organization to uh, uh, provide uh, patients a cancer and COVID source when when pandemic hit uh, cancer patients didn't know where to go so we provided them an online solution where they could connect with uh, uh, physicians uh, so this was and we were also first to you know uh, bring uh, uh, a covid-19 global summit where we brought uh, pharma diagnostics uh, uh, and you know antibody discovery as well as vaccine worlds you know folks together to you know brainstorm how to tackle the challenges associated with pandemic we also have a woman in precision medicine group that focuses on you know focuses on women taking uh, a lead in the in the field of uh, uh, precision medicine and uh, you know uh, and nothing would have been done uh, without the support of uh, our uh, you know our uh, uh, our uh, you know uh, uh, supporters who are individuals corporations foundations uh, 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 that share the same vision of uh, to scale the precision medicine uh, which we call uh, modern medicine actually and we are big in recognitions we have you know we uh, recognize the community and uh, uh, we know that you know recognitions make uh, people work harder and we need uh, folks to work harder during these hard times actually so as I said AAPM and meeting 2021 was a grand success i invite you to the 2022 and thank you very much and that's my email in case you want to get to me and overall i think uh, i will leave you with this thought that this is one painting it's called the painting is called the doctor by luke uh, you know uh, fields actually it's basically shows a relationship between a physician contemplating uh, you know looking at the at the patient actually so overall the goal should be as we technology and and um, you know advances the goal should be we give more time to between patient and uh, physicians and and you know let the technology automations uh, take care of the other stuff with that thank you very much uh, i can take some questions if you have thank you so much dr uh, Prasoon, for your uh, insightful presentation there are a couple questions uh the first one is from doug from within three um he's saying what, once the multiple data sets and sources are aggregated and properly formatted, where is the output discussed and collaborated on, i.e. the human element? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, actually. So basically, as you uh, uh, as you see that these are all you know multi omics uh, data sets, actually. So uh, so what uh, so far you know the, some of the hospitals and uh, healthcare systems are very you know uh, uh, precisely were able to identify mutations and uh, and uh, you know match it with uh, what drugs will work, actually. So I think we were also able to launch some basket trials. Basket trials means you know one trial will uh, you know have several drugs and several mutations actually and they, that'll be one basket actually so I think we have made uh, you know that uh, so that's a human element and moving forward I think we would like to you know ha have uh, have you know digital health take uh, you know a major stand in not only just a, a reactive healthcare but also proactive healthcare because so that we can help uh, folks be you know uh, more he healthy from the beginning actually so that's the promise of uh, precision medicine. Hope that answered your question. And uh, one last, I think, question or comment from Michael from uh, Stryker. He's saying, a lot of times companion diagnostic products and pharma are not aware of technical, regulatory, and educational requirements to commercialize products. Um, I think that was more common. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I think that's the and and pharma is you know has addressed this. They have made you know their regulatory you know regulatory bodies very strong. Actually, if if you see some of the you know recent response from the pharma that has been you know put forward against the pandemic, you know testing the drugs which is working, which is not working, we have seen a lot of successes and we have seen a lot of failures. Right, I think so. They have built a regulatory, but I think like you said, the regulatory landscape is changing. Right. I think and then so there's a constant learning that you know we uh, that the you know regulatory team has to do but i think you know i can just assure you that they are one of the hardest working people right now actually you know uh, getting the drugs through the regulatory you know approval through the regulatory pathway not only us but worldwide regulatory agencies hope that helps actually yeah thank you doug yeah okay.